This is the Canadian Mountain Podcast, brought to you by the Canadian Mountain Network. This is episode three of the Canadian Mountain Podcast entitled, Traditional Knowledge and Community-Based Research in Yukon Territory. This episode was recorded in April 2017 at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. Hello and welcome to the Canadian Mountain Podcast. I'm Meg Wilcox. And today I'm connecting with four people who are working and doing research in Yukon Territory. First, we have Norma Cassie and Caitlin Friendship. They are from the Arctic Institute of Community-Based Research in Whitehorse. Norma is the Indigenous collaborator and Caitlin is the co-director of the Institute. Secondly, we have Catherine Stewart, and she is a professor in the Department of Soil Science at the University of Saskatchewan. Her research and educational work with Yukon College ties into the Coffee Creek region, which is about 130 kilometers south of Dawson City, and Catherine is currently in Saskatoon. And last but not least, we have Doug Clark. He's a professor with the School of Environment and Sustainability, also from the University of Saskatchewan, and a project that he's working on right now called Shu Ai Atlet, which translates to Water in Me. It's a program that's based within the Champagne and Asiac First Nations in Yukon Territory, and that's near Haines Junction. But Doug is also currently based in Saskatoon. So while all of your work is unique in its scope and its focus, you're all doing great work in the Yukon that focuses on promoting and encouraging traditional knowledge, working collaboratively within communities, governments, and in some cases, industry. And that's what we'll be talking about today, just how these partnerships work, the challenges, the successes of these types of programs, and uh, where you see all of this heading in the future. And I know that's a lot as far as a topic. It might be a bit daunting, but thankfully we have an hour to talk about this. So thank you so much for joining me in, in this discussion. Thank you. Great. So I thought first we might go around and talk a little bit about each of your projects just so the audience gets an idea of the work that you do. And uh, Norma, I, I thought I'd, I'd start with, with you first and just ask uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, what exactly is the Arctic Institute of Community-Based Research and, and what is the work that you do? Well, basically, uh, the Arctic Institute of Community-Based Research is a non-profit organization and we're based in Whitehorse. And uh, it was co-founded by myself and Jody Butler Walker. And um, what we do is uh, we work towards developing um, uh, healthy lifestyle solutions and assisting with developing um, healthy lifestyles within the communities. And particularly, um, the priorities were were set way back in 2007, um, and the areas were uh, chronic diseases prevention. Um, climate change adaptation, youth mental wellness, um, and uh, food security. And uh, so those were the areas that we have been working on since then. And what we do is very much community-based research, um, where the community will partner with us or request our assistance in developing uh, a research project within their community uh, within the health area. So we have been doing that since 2007. In the last few years, there's been a sense of urgency in the area of climate change adaptation, in particularly in relation to food. Um, so that's been the, our main focus within the last three years. And uh, one of the projects that you were working on within the past few years was at, at Bur in Burwash. And I was wondering, Caitlin, if you could speak a little bit to the, the research that was going on there around f food security in that community. Sure, yeah. So Kowani First Nation approached us to work with them on a project uh, basically to help identify their priorities and strategies around being more food secure. Burwash is about 300 kilometers away from Whitehorse, doesn't have a grocery store, and so it's a, a major issue for them there, as well as with climate change and changes to traditional food species and being able to access those. And so we partnered with the community, um, had an advisory committee, as well as hired youth researchers to do this work. And, and from that, this project evolved into a couple of different phases with, with different components, which we're happy to, to talk about in more detail. And yeah, well, let's let's talk a little bit about those phases and sort of what the project looked like or how it went through. So um, 
like I said earlier, the, the, the work that we do in the communities is basically pretty much in, in total direction from the community. Um, they control the entire research project. We set it up that way. We make sure that they, we create a committee to begin with, and uh, that's very from the from the community itself. And um, we make sure also that we we educate the youth at every step of the way, so that they will understand the purpose of the research to begin with, what's going on in the world, and what's ha and and all its effects right to their territory. So we begin the research that way and it's a uh, very community based. It's, it, um, and then we start, we create a methodology along with the elders and, and the guiding council. It could be the chief and council or, or it, as well as our committee. And, uh, and then we begin the research that way. And uh, this research was um, to, because of the climate changes, the, they, the Kwani First Nations people live in one of the world's highest mountain mountainous areas. Those glaciers are now melting at a very, very fast rate and has been for a long time. They've been watching it for many, many years and to a point where it's beginning to affect their entire way of life. Um, the, the mountain resources that they have depended on for thousands of years, the caribou, the moose, the sheep, are declining and there's also effects on their fish in, in again in Kalwani Lake which is a one of Yukon's biggest lakes so therefore they wanted to to begin looking at their future in terms of uh, how food secure how in food how food secure can they really become and develop a strategy and a plan towards that so um, that's pretty much the gist of the project and uh, it took us two and a half years to or three years actually to complete it we we also um photo voicing is a very huge part of our our community-based research uh where all the kids are given cameras they're either given video cameras as well and uh, we train them to do films and photo voice projects and uh so that's part of the project in terms of educating the entire community or working along with the community in a long term. So, um, and then out of that, out of the research came a certain amount of rec uh, certain recommendations that needed to be followed up upon and uh, assisted in and the re also further research was required to, to um, come out with more answers, for example, there, they had concerns about their fish in the in this big beautiful lake. So we collected, we got the youth and the local fishers and trappers, I mean fishers, to work with the youth to um, collect over 200 samples of fish. And uh, we worked with Heidi Swanson and Nel 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 Nelson Zabel from the University of Waterloo, and uh, and then we had four youth along with us who we. Uh, they they got the fish, they analyzed it, they took the samples, they analyzed them, we took them down to University of Waterloo in the lab, they they um, they analyzed their own fish from Kalwani Lake for mercury content. Um, so the education of the youth and uh, and all of that is paramount in, in the, the kind of research that we do. Looking now as this project is wrapped up over its three year span, what do you think the community has gained other, like, like, I mean, in terms of knowledge, but in terms of sense of community, what do you think some of the impacts have been? Um, out of due respect, um, it's best that the Kalwani First Nations um, speak about these issues, and I'm sure that together we can work that out later on. Um, however, they have um, spoken publicly through the their development corporation office about how they are now working towards better energy. They are developing solar systems. They are now looking at um, uh, developing the geothermal to to their in their community. They're working at that very strongly now and allocate looking for resources and partners to work in that area. And they're they're wanting to develop a um, huge greenhouse uh, garden that will service not only their community but. Out, or surrounding outlying communities as well. So they are moving forward in many ways and they have been for a long, long time. The research just contributed a, a little bit to that. 
considering the fact that Burr Washington is an example of one of many projects that you've worked on in the in the ten years that the institute has been around, what would you say right now, looking at, at different communities across the territory and in the north, what are some of the biggest issues or trends that you're seeing that not just one community but but maybe several communities are facing? I think um, the Yukon Territory with respect to climate change is one of the fastest melting areas in the circumpolar regions. Um, so therefore, uh, there has food and clean water has become uh, prioritized issues um, at, the, at the very grassroots level of the communities. Uh, there is huge concern um, with respect to declining um, uh, food sources like a re um, animal food sources, moose, caribou, and fish, those, uh, those kinds of things that like right now, for example, the salmon doesn't, there's hardly any salmon that come up the Yukon rivers now from, from Alaska side, uh, from the Pacific ocean on that side. So those are, uh, those are huge concerns. Um, so there is definitely a need, um, and the elders have been saying this for a long, long time to us that you, you need to plan forward. Um, so therefore, um, a lot of the communities are engaging in those processes now. They're beginning to uh, lay out plans for their future, in particularly in the area of those two things, food and water security. Mm -hmm. And we'll be coming back to water security and, and water stewardship when we talk a bit about Doug's project as well. Um, but let's talk, uh, Catherine, briefly about, about your research and the work that you've been doing up around Coffee Creek. So uh, so you've been working, or you were doing work with the Kenyak Gold Corporation in the Coffee Creek, Creek, Creek region near Dawson City, or south of Dawson City, I should say. Uh, tell me a bit about that that work. Sure. Well, the work really started in the summer of 2015, and it was an integrated project um, meant to integrate both research and education. And in addition to that, we were really looking at integrating different ways of knowing and how those different ways of knowing could help inform the restoration process. So about 130 kilometers south uh, of Dawson City in the traditional territory of the Trondikwichin, um, there's a mining exploration site. It's, uh, it's a gold uh, mine. Um, and I've been working with Kamenak uh, Gold Corporation around looking at what sort of restoration techniques they could develop, identifying sources of restoration materials, uh, seeds on site, and looking at developing protocols and then also preserving materials. And as part of that project, we were able to form a collaboration with Yukon College through the Center for Northern Innovation and Mining, as well as with Trond de Gwichin. And uh, together we developed, and Kamenak Gold Corporation, we developed uh, a program where the students uh, in a 12-day in a education program would be able to come to the mine site and for the first eight days of that program uh, we worked with the students uh, exposing them both to the research we were doing and involving them in some of the, the seed collection but also use it as a way to introduce students to restoration and the restoration process and provide education on uh, plant ecology and, and soil science. The last four days of that program were actually spent in Dawson City uh, and we had some experts in horticulture of native plants come up and work with the students for, for four days in the community greenhouse there. And the idea behind that portion of the, the project was looking at potential to have greenhousing in northern communities for native plants that could be used for mine site restoration. And so it was, a, it was a really excellent opportunity to um, bring a lot of different people together from different perspectives. And one of the things I think that uh, was a, quite a, a good and strong part of our project um, was that when we were on site at the uh, Coffee Creek project, we were able to have uh, two elders from the Trondrickwichin join uh, the, the education program. And we really tried to integrate 
uh, some of those different ways of knowing. So having the opportunity to have the elders there to talk about traditional uses of plants and traditional medicinal uses of plants and work directly with the students and also with our research team was really valuable. Uh, and I think one of the underlying things that we were trying to communicate to the students uh, had to do about uh, the values that are involved with restoration. So when we think about restoration, we need to think about the values that are associated with that land and really who drives uh, how that restoration should proceed and what values end up on that land, say, after industry has been in the area. And so I think having the opportunity to have both some uh, traditional ecological knowledge as well as some more Western scientific types of approaches uh, help to provide an opportunity for those students to see perhaps ways that we could integrate those different ways of knowing into the restoration process. And you had a chance to go back after doing the course ab about a year later and, and you'd mentioned being able to, to meet with the elders again. And I, I'm just curious as to what they had expressed in terms of seeing the, the program continue and, and sort of wh where things were at. Yeah, I, d I did have an opportunity to go back up to Dawson City. Um, we we were really lucky during the the course. We also were able to produce a few short videos, and some of those videos, um, the elders were kind enough to share some of their knowledge about the plants and, and allow us to share those videos as well. So when I went back, I had the opportunity to chat with them about those videos. Um, and again, I'm always learning, so learn more um, just about using traditional plants. Um, and in terms of seeing things go forward, I mean, that wasn't a, that wasn't a topic of discussion that we had, um, but I do have ongoing work at the site. Um, the industry partner has since changed, um, but there were four... Um, of the students that were in the course that are part of the environmental monitoring team. And those four individuals have continued to work as environmental monitors. And so I've had ongoing um, connections with them and opportunities to go to the field with them again since. Um, and I think they expressed for sure that they felt that there was value in the education course that we had provided and uh, and sometimes I can see in just working with them and continuing to work with them in the field that there's been a benefit in terms of having a broader understanding of, of restoration on the site. And and you did mention that the change in, in the company right now, Kamiak has still has since been bought out by, by Gold Corp. And I was just wondering, uh, is there any determination yet if the program will continue or, or, or where are things at at this point? Yeah, I mean, this is always an interesting thing when you work at this intersection of community and industry and research and education. There, there's always changing players and sometimes that can make and break a project. Um, and fortunately, right now, it looks like we will be continuing uh, weaving our, our research lab. We'll be continuing to work with, um, with Gold Corp, which is the new industry partner. And I know that uh, those same environmental monitors have been hired to work on site this summer. And so we'll be returning to site in July um, we're looking at setting up a, a three-year project there uh, where we're going to be doing ongoing testing of some of the restoration techniques as well as the materials that we're proposing for that site. And so we'll be working uh, directly with those environmental monitors. And it's a huge uh, bonus to us as part of our research efforts because it allows us to have people on site who are there, not just in the couple weeks that we can uh, fly in for, but I get pictures and updates from the monitors throughout the whole summer. And so it's, it's a really valuable thing to have that team to work with. Fantastic. So more work up in the Coffee Creek region this summer for you. And uh, we'll, we'll turn to Doug now and, and chat a bit about your work before we start talking about all these interesting examples you guys are giving of collaboration and youth training and, and working with different partners. Um, and, and Doug, your work ties into a bunch of that as well. So first, um, why don't you describe the, the current research project? Sure. Well, Chua'i Atlet is the name of the project, and it was given to us uh, to our work by 
former chief Diane Strand. Uh, this, this project's still very much in its early days uh, as a project, but it had a very long development. Uh, it started with an opportunity originally identified by Yukon College uh, with uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council funding to link colleges with communities. They got in touch with me because they know I do shirk type research uh, and I have a relationship with them. And they said, hey, do you know any communities that would be interested in doing something with us? And so I phoned colleagues at the Champagne and Asiac First Nation, who I've been working with uh, on various research projects for about 14 years now, and said, what have you got on deck? And their response was that our top priority right now is developing a water strategy for our First Nations traditional territory. So what we did over about a year and a half of putting this all together uh, was develop a project that takes the applied social science tools that I've been working with that government and their citizens with for quite some time, uh, and we shifted the focus to water. And this, is, this allowed us to pull a whole bunch of really interesting things together and, and do it in a way that, that I think is frankly really exciting. Um, what we're doing is really moving towards what I think we could call community-led research. Um, this is an idea from a need identified by a community. Uh, they were fully involved in helping all shapes, all, 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 all the, the stages in the development. We had some seed funding from our Global Institute of Water Security down here at the university. That let us have a kickoff workshop at Cluckshoe Village in 2015, where we brought in elders and citizens who told us uh, what they wanted to see happen with water in their traditional territory. Then we took that, and uh, I was I, I was up there at the time. Yukon College hosted me for six months during my sabbatical, so I was there. I was just literally just up the road from people, and we could put this together. We put a shirt grant proposal together, uh, and we were successful. So now uh, the work is being done by a team uh, that, that's being led by Champagne and Asiac citizens. We have a couple of emerging young leaders who are really taking uh, taking the lead in in bringing this project to into reality. And what's happening now is that I and, and the other academic uh, members of the team, um, a colleague from the University of Alberta, Ellen Belowski, and also our, uh, our Whitehorse-based postdoc, uh, Dr. Sajada Manandar, um, the three of us are kind of taking a support role and taking a step back. And this is this is a little bit different. This is a little bit new. Basically, it's not about us anymore. It's about the community's needs and building the community capacity to get where they want. Ultimately, uh, as I understand it, where Champagne and Asiac First Nation would like to go with this type of work is to, to really document and understand uh, and develop very, very grounded, rooted, communicable knowledge about their values around water so that they can not just contribute to governance, uh, licensing, uh, management of water resources, but ultimately so that this work can articulate an indigenous ethic about water stewardship that we can start to reorient these scientific and governance processes around. This is a community that you've been doing research in, in a variety of different areas, but you've been working within the First Nation and, and working with them for the past 14 years. How do you think that informs the work now, especially now that it's being led by citizens? Uh, profoundly. Uh, it, it's actually 17 if we count the years before I became an academic when I was working with, with CAFN in different capacities. So, you know, really what's happening uh, is happening as a result of the relationships that we have. And, and that's one of the magic ingredients in Northern research that's successful, is that there are good, solid relationships. When you get to know one another as people and you get to understand who one another are, you can get through challenging times. You and Catherine talked a moment ago about changing players, changing circumstances. If the relationships are solid, you can get through that stuff and adapt and carry on. So, uh, yeah, I think I think that has a, a, an enormous amount to do with what's going on and, and, and how it's starting. You uh, also mentioned the, uh, or I don't know if we've gotten to it yet, um, but uh, so, Doug, normally when we look at these types of developing policy frameworks, it can be kind of hypothetical, but in this case, 
the First Nation actually has a large decision that they will be able to play a part in, and that's with the Asiac Hydro Plant. The uh, license is coming up for renewal in 2018. So it, I'm guessing there's a push to get this done so that, so that they can act some of this within the near future. A push is putting it mildly. So yeah, you 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 bring up a really great point. The Asiac hydroelectric facility provides about a third of the power for the Yukon, and as I understand it, most of the surge capacity, which is what's needed when people come home from work on Christmas Eve and everybody fires up their their ovens and stoves and plugs in the Christmas tree. So it, it's pretty important. Uh, it was installed quite some time ago, and. Uh, has had some impacts biophysically and on First Nation livelihoods. That's you know a fairly, fairly well known uh, well known uh, issue. So what's what's fascinating is that Champagne and Asiac First Nation and Yukon Energy Corporation are working together, and I I've got to say working remarkably progressively uh, to get through the relicensing process in a manner that uh, goes as far as possible towards addressing those impacts and addressing CAFN's ongoing interests and values. So when we were putting together the proposal, I got to admit we ran hot and cold literally on whether we wanted to dive into ASIAC, but as the projects come on and evolved, uh, it's become very clear that there's a pressing need for us to support the work that uh, Champagne and ASIAC First Nation and Yukon Energy Corporation are undertaking in order to inform the licensing decisions which are going to be made by uh, the Yukon Water Board and the Yukon uh, Environmental and Socioeconomic Assessment Board. So those uh, pieces of work are being led by CAFN uh, and supported by all of the rest of us in multiple ways. And this is where us researchers can bring something uh, valuable to the party in terms of uh, the toolbox, uh, the, the techniques, the resources that we have access to, and we can deploy them in ways that assists First Nations and the broader Yukon public uh, reach a decision in, you know, in the most fully informed way possible. Um, it's working with a pretty horrendous timeline, um, but it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's a pretty rewarding thing when you think, wow, we've got an opportunity to help uh, create this type of input for, for something of this import. So all of your projects really run the gamut. Uh, but one of the things that I, I see as a, as a connecting idea is the respect and value for traditional knowledge in, in the work that, that you're all doing. And I was wondering if Norma and Caitlin, maybe you'd like to speak to that first, just why, why it's important that, that organizations, researchers, people that are in the North are making sure that there is a focus and, and how you can go about putting a focus on traditional knowledge in some environments where perhaps it hasn't been as valued in the past? Well, um, very recently, um, there's been a find down the, down the Porcupine River at the Bluefish Caves where um, human remains of our people have been found that dates back to 27,000 years ago. So that's absolute truth that we've been here for a long time and that uh, that uh, the Athabascan people uh, that live in this area are um, truly like from the, uh, the areas that we, we take care of. So therefore our knowledge is, in, it is uh, really connected to, to the areas that we were destined to take care of. Um, uh, the, so therefore, our knowledge is is very important in our survival. We've been here that long, and we're we're going to continue to survive. No matter what comes forward, we will. We have the resiliency. We have the knowledge. We have the concepts to be able to work with each other in, in as as a peoples. So therefore, our knowledge is extremely important in, in all decision-making processes, in, in everything that we do. Like if anyone understands their homelands um, at all, it's us. It's where we come from. It's who we are. We're part of the land, part of the water uh, from the areas that we are from. So um, traditional knowledge is very, very important and should be the ultimate driver for for sustaining our cultures into the future. So um, 
yeah, it, that's why we keep saying for years and years and years that our knowledge is, is what and our re resiliency because of that knowledge and connection to our homelands is what going is 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 what is going to be um, um, uh, is becoming more and increasingly more important for us to to live by. So um, it's in our language. Our knowledge is within our languages, and and it's very important to to be able to collect that knowledge while while some of our per people are still living with our languages as well. Because the the ancient methods of conservation, the ancient methods of preservation, the ancient methods of sharing and dialoguing with each other is all within our languages, and it's it's lucky it, we're lucky in some of our communities that we still do have people um, like at my age or older now that still are still alive and they do understand the language and understand all the cultural and traditional concepts within. Um, and, and Catherine, I, I think this would be a good time to pull you in too because talking about the idea of preserving old, like traditional knowledge from elders who, who may not be with the community much longer. And I'm just thinking that the training specifically with the youth it, around the Coffee Creek area, how did you find that being able to watch the elders in this 12-day program working with the youth to help train them for, for the work that they, they ended up doing as, uh, as these stewards? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Nora just articulated it really well why that traditional knowledge is so pertinent and so really necessary. Um, so often we'll think about a, a mining life cycle, for example, of 15 years. So a mining life cycle would be from the exploration into operations and then into closure. And people will say, oh, it's a really long mining life cycle. It might be 20 years. Well, when you think of it in the same context as what Norma was just speaking about, um, and now we're at the end of that closure and we're thinking about how are we going to restore this land and what do we understand about how wildlife moves in this area and what do we understand about conservation of, of, of plants. Um, there's such a wealth of knowledge um, in the communities in the Yukon, I mean across Canada, across the world. Um, but uh, specifically, I think for, for our site, um, I, I learned a lot, and I think the students learned a lot from having elders there sharing that knowledge. And I think one of the, the moments in the course where I thought, you know, you, you work very hard sometimes to try to get the right people together in the right room and create situations where positive change can happen. And every once in a while you get a glimmer. And uh, I would say a glimmer for me during the course um, was a moment where we had one of the students, a very outgoing student, um, and that student had gone and found a, a, a fungus growing on a tree and brought it back and took it to the, the one of the elders there and said, what can you tell me about this and how have we used this in the past? And so, you know, Doug mentioned this, some of the greatest moments for us as educators and researchers are when we just get to like back away to the skirts of the room and watch things happen. And so for me, that was one of those moments where I thought, this is this is exactly what this program was intended for and then and, and it worked and so i think that sharing of knowledge is so important um within the the communities and doug do you want to jump in on that uh considering how you are right now in this position where you're sort of you know handing the keys over to the to the community and saying go ahead what are you finding that are some tools that are working to to help engage the, the community to be able to share their thoughts and, and move forward on that? Yeah, we, we're, we're doing a whole bunch of things. Um, at, at kind of the meta level, one of the really interesting things is that the, the, the relationships and the, the research team is now comprised of two generations of CAFN leaders that I've, that I've worked with. Um, one more senior leadership level that provided the genesis of the project and kind of keeps us on course, uh, consulting with, with traditional elders when they really feel they need that. But now we've got these younger leaders um, emerging and their capabilities uh, are, are, are just amazing. Um, one of them uh, started a PhD with me here at the university in September. And 
uh, it's it's a blast working with her. Uh, she brings such a such a, a, a vibrant and fresh perspective on so much of this. And um, one of the things that has that I that I've benefited from is that uh, these young leaders know the linguistic, the cultural context. They 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 are it. They live it. And they also know the labels that we in the ivory tower put on all of these things. And these folks helped me put together the terminology in indigenous research methods that are that are starting to to, to really you know hit stride now uh, with things that the community had been telling me for years, but telling me in you know real plain language and situated where I am. Uh, they've helped me so much to do my job more effectively. So basically, probably the biggest thing we've got going for us is that we have an amazing team that complements itself so well. And the, the team is functioning at such a level that th these young leaders are really the ones telling us, well, I think we kind of need to do this to get this. And, you know, we kick things around as a, as a group and you know, typically, yeah, we do go with what they what the, what they originally thought. Um, often, with some advice and some guidance from from more experienced team members to to tweak it a bit. But their instincts, their knowledge, and their uh, their application are just bang on. Uh, one of the things that seems to come up from hearing about your different projects is, in in many ways, you're all mediators between different groups that may have different goals, but that also, as Doug, you were mentioning, sometimes just have different languages, right? Like academic work between, you know, being in the in the First Nation. And so I'm wondering how, what kind of guidelines or, or rules do you consider as you're trying to navigate these different areas, right? Like you, using di different languages literally and figuratively or vocabulary. Um, and also I, I'm thinking, you know, in, in Catherine's case, we're looking at the minds and how that might, how they might be looking at the situation. We're looking at the uh, the Trondak Gwich'in who see a different view of their land. If we look even in in Burwash, as they're trying to figure out these solutions to issues that are, are have been caused by climate change, right? But they're also trying to affect change in terms of policy within their community so that they can support their people. How how do you navigate all these moving parts when not everyone's speaking the same language always? Well, um, I, I guess uh, uh, being a long time, uh, like I lived in the Yukon all my life. Uh, I know all, we, we, all of our, all our communities know each other and we, uh, there are still, when I go treading on uh, someone else's territory, I tread very lightly and very carefully and very respectfully. And, uh, and then what I do then is I meet with the leadership and then they they recommend people to us um, that will that will help that will move the project or or the process forward and um, and we also make sure that the youth are very much involved because I we train them actually to to be the researchers to to ask the questions and they sit in front of their elders, their grandmothers, their aunties, and their their relatives, pretty much in the whole community, and in front of their leaders. And they ask the direct questions once they're trained. And therefore, then people just automatically open up their hearts to them. And, um, and, and the process is all holistic. They're learning right there on the spot. They... And we're collecting data with our own little tape recorder, and um, and then and then at the end of it all, um, you know, we facilitate the process. However, the 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 young people and whoever we're working with become the facilitators in the community themselves. So basically, we just guide the project very ethically and very respectfully, and pretty much the community comes out with its own solutions and um, come out with their own uh, uh, processes and recommendations for their future. So, um, yes, it's, uh, it's um, and because I've had, also we've had tremendous amount of abilities to learn from each other, like Caitlin and Jody and them are very highly academic people. So therefore, uh, we, we there's knowledge exchange between all of us within our circles as well. Like 
with with all the researchers and scientists that we work with across the country, we we collaborate and we partner and we share knowledge and we work with each other and we we work very hard to mesh traditional knowledge as well as scientific knowledge together and we bring certain amount of you know a little bit of expertise to the communities where we come from the process of trying to facilitate that and draw that out from the people themselves so it's um it, it's 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 a uh, in the end, it's all their work. It's all they're doing. It's all their own dreams and aspirations for their own people. Caitlin, jump in. Oh, I was just going to add to that, um, just really emphasizing the, the importance of having that ongoing communication and relationship building and trust and, and having different members on the team and from all different perspectives and just being open is, is critical. Um, and also recognizing that every community that you, you work with is very different. They all have their own traditional knowledge protocols. And, and so just being able to, to be here, to be from here, and be able to understand those things is, is really important. And Catherine, in your experience working, you know, it partly as a mediator and an educator while doing your research, what, what have you sort of taken away from the experience? Um, I think some of the things that have, have already been said, um, definitely uh, being respectful, especially when you are not necessarily in your own uh, court or out of your own area of expertise. So really knowing what you don't know uh, has been something that I've, I've learned. I think I'm continually uh, relearning. Um, and I think building those relationships, you know, Doug has talked about that and Caitlin just talked about it. And, and I, I can't emphasize enough that the success of any project that I've had that's worked with kind of these multiple stakeholders has hinged entirely on the relationships and building those relationships. Uh, it certainly helped that when I ran the program in 2015, I was uh, in the Yukon and had lived there for about four years at that time. And so actually being there on the ground and uh, getting to know um, key people and being able to build relationships with them is essential to making those projects work because it really is all about trust and I see that a lot in the work that I do because I work with industry, I work with mining, I sometimes work with um, energy corporations um, and so sometimes there is a, a legacy of mistrust that's there and so it's being aware sometimes of even the, the history of what you're walking into and I've been in several situations where we weren't fully aware of that history um, and that changes things immensely so really um, backing up slowing down taking time having coffee <laughs> um, I think all of those things are what can help those projects be successful I, I think the other thing too that I try to really adhere to is that I see myself as bringing people together and I try to assist with a process to improve the process and relationship building between others so that better decisions can be made, so that um, industry and community can work together more effectively. Um, but I always try to remove myself from any role of any actual decisions because obviously that's not my place. I'm, I'm neither from the industry nor am I from the community. So making sure that um, I keep that as a pretty clear line in the work that I do and really just trying to find ways to help people work together more effectively. Doug, I see you nodding a lot as Catherine speaking. Any other thoughts and in, in, in that you know role as sort of mediator? Yeah, a few. I mean, you always seem to have me here set up to follow some really great stuff that uh, <laughs> that, that my colleagues are bringing here. But I'll, I'll try. Yeah, uh, picking up on what something something all of them have said is, if I've learned one thing, it's some pretty profound humility and the need to keep that. Um, and doubly so when I don't live in the north anymore. Um, you know, Catherine spoke about her time living there that has given her these skills and experience and given her what she needs to be successful with her research program. And I have no doubt, you know, it's going to carry her forward successfully. 
um, it's really hard when you're not there and it's it's challenging in all kinds of ways and one thing I've, I've had to relearn a couple of times and no doubt I'll have to relearn it more is that when I'm away uh, I mean I guess as, as preamble most of my research program is places where I lived before I became an academic. Things just work better that way for all the reasons that people have talked about. But I find that not living there anymore, it's really easy for me to assume too much. Life in those places carries on without me, and I need to always remember that and never believe that I am always right about my suppositions or my thoughts or my inferences. I always need to, to check and double check and recheck with people. And uh, that, you know, there's, there's, there's never going to be any way around that. Even, even were I, I up there doing this work full time, I'd still have to do that, but it would be a little bit easier. And, and I think going forward, this, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a message here for institutions, uh, for, for researchers in southern based universities and colleges to fulfill the expectations that northerners have of us, um, we're going to have to push the envelope. Uh, we're going to have to try some new ways of doing things. Uh, Chuai Atlet would probably not have come about in the same way had I not had a sabbatical and a northern institution willing to host me for six months while we worked on that. So, you know, we're going to have to up our game here in the south. Uh, and that has to be at an institutional level. It can't just be on the shoulders of institutional researchers. Well, and, and that brings the idea of, um, you know, so many, like, all of the researchers, generally speaking, will be based in a southern institution. I mean, you guys are examples, right, Catherine and Doug, of working right now at the University of Sask Saskatchewan, but also having done work with Yukon College and now continuing your work up north. Um, how how do we find that balance of keeping knowledge in the north, getting funding dollars to the north, helping encourage these institutions to be able to provide that that balance so that it, it isn't just a situation of, of people going up on the going up for their field study and coming back down and, and publishing in the south? May I jump in on that? Please do. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I, I think I, I think we can't. Uh, <laughs> We can't do it with those conventional uh, conventional approaches the way that Northerners want to see it done anymore. Uh, it, it cannot and should not, uh, Northerners cannot and should not rely on Southern institutions to meet those needs. We need Northern post-secondary institutions and not just one. It can't be just one single university of the North because that's kind of a Southern ideal. The North is a big and diverse place. It needs you know, probably three to five. And if you look at where the action is, there are so many organizations at multiple scales with research missions and mandates in the North. Uh, Norma and Caitlin are, are you know, a, a leading example of that. The Yukon's a hot spot for this, but these kinds of things are happening all over. Um, Southern institutions need to be aware of this. And if they want to continue to play in the North, they need to, to meet Northerners on their own terms. Uh, with our Chuayet let grant, we made the very deliberate decision to house that grant in the Yukon uh, to keep the money as close to the project and the people involved as possible. Catherine, any any thoughts? Yeah, I would just I would absolutely agree with Doug that we need post secondary education institutions in the north, and I agree not just one one university of the north because. Um, you know, I've, I've worked in many areas across the Arctic in Canada and, and within the, the subarctic in the Yukon, and they're very, very different places with very different needs. Um, but one thing uh, uh, that Doug had mentioned earlier was about how the leaders, the young youth that he's working with and people that he has working as PhD students um, that may be from northern communities, the strength that they bring. And I just want to echo that that's something that I certainly have seen. Um, many of the young people that I've worked with, including the environmental monitors uh, from Trondigwichen, they are really the future in the north in terms of the leadership that they bring. And they do, I have at least witnessed, uh, a way of... Um, integrating knowledge and different ways of knowing that is quite amazing and I and I think that they will be the future and be able to help create positive lasting change in the north but in order to support 
those those leaders that are that are coming um, from communities and smaller communities in the north. We need institutions, post secondary institutions, to support them. Norma, Caitlin. Um, I think. Um, well, first of all, uh, in the indigenous world across the country now, um, uh, because science has done such harm to to our people in the past, um, there there our people have now taken control um, across the country. Uh, over six hundred um, First Nations across the country accepted the the OCAP protocols. That's ownership, control, access, and possession of um, any kind of research coming within our territories, and 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 the Yukon is no different. And however, some of the uh, the First Nations governments in the Yukon Territory have their own protocols, as people as Caitlin talked about earlier, and those protocols are very very important nowadays. And, and Doug is absolutely right. Southern institutions are going to have to change their ways. Um, we do, like as, as an Indigenous elder now, I, I really take a strong, um, I have a strong way of thinking that um, we definitely need to participate and shape the world uh, and, and academics and how they move forward. Uh, with our young people nowadays and, and make sure that Indigenous knowledge is incorporated into their thinking because it's Indigenous knowledge that's going to assist in, in assisting them in their future. And, it, it, and it's very important. And we, uh, like, for instance, in my country, I was taught to learn about from every pine needle right to the biggest animal there ever walked in my country. So therefore, that knowledge is very, very important to, to, to many and the way the state of the world is going. Um, and in 30 to 50 years, unfortunately, you know, our planet, we didn't leave a very good planet for our future. So we have to work together and be true partners in any kind of research now. We have to be equal partners in research in, in our country. And that is absolutely important. And uh, so, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, it's not that a lot of us in the Indigenous world, we just don't trust research anymore and we don't want it anymore. There is that as well. And you can't blame people for that. However, on the other hand, there's those of, the, those of many of our nations are welcoming it as long as the knowledge is is equally shared and, and, and that uh, Indigenous knowledge is um, on top and major, major in all of the research that takes place. Um, so that's where I come from. And I think also just to add to that, you know, there's, there's certainly a very, very important role that Southern uh, institutions can play in the North, but, but we need resources here in the North as well. And so to have that equal playing field in terms of being able to fund organizations like ourselves, be able to fund students and researchers in the North to, to be on that equal level uh, playing field is critical. And, and most, the way, as you were saying, Doug, like most, um, the way things work in terms of funding structures with, with universities is there isn't, you're not given resources to do all of that pre-relationship work, work that needs to be done before you even think about a proposal with a community. And so there's some really hardcore structures that need to be changed and, and recognizing, as we've all said here, that we have our own solutions. We have, we know what needs to be done. We just need some help with doing it sometimes, so. Wonderful. I think that's a, a perfect place to end it, talking about the role of doing the research in the North and the future, and hopefully being able to find ways and solutions to be able to, to come up with those resources so that, that local groups can make decisions for themselves now and in, in the longer term and future. So thank you so much for chatting with me, you guys, today. I, I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So Norma Cassie and Caitlin Ann Friendship are from the Arctic Institute of Community-Based Research in Whitehorse. Catherine Stewart is a professor in the Department of Soil Science at the University of Saskatchewan. And Doug Clark is a professor with the School of Environment and Sustainability, also from the University of Saskatchewan. 
Special thanks to our panelists, to Meg Wilcox, our host, and to the University of Alberta and the Faculty of Science for supporting this podcast. 